We're going to look at some points which God has given me to bring, not all of you, and we're going to maybe keep some for a later date, because God wants you to do business with some of you this morning. We have to pick up what God has been saying, and we have to align ourselves with what God is doing. And God has spoken this morning about breaking chains, anything that binds us, and he's calling us to come and swim deeper and to come into the fullness of what he has for us. So it maybe wouldn't surprise us too much at the title or the, the theme that we have for this morning is the growth of the rebirth. Over the last few weeks or even months now, we've been looking at what it really means to be born again. Uh, it's a subject which I absolutely love. Um, and this morning, I would like us to continue looking at that and to have a chat about the growth of the rebirth and to be grown and maturing into everything that God has for us. But before we do that, let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask for his help. <coughs> Father God, I thank you that you're here this morning. Yes. And that God, that you want to do a work in all of our hearts, and I pray, Holy Spirit, that what we're about to look at through your word, that, Lord, that you would work it out in every one of our hearts. Lord, I stand in the mighty name of Jesus. And I take authority of your name, Lord. And God, I pray against everything that would maybe try to come against us from hearing and receiving your word. And that, Lord, which might try to push it away and stop it from finding its home and lodging place and allowing it to do its work. God, in your name, Lord, there it be a, a clear pathway, Lord, not from our voice, but from your voice, into the depths of our spirits this day we pray, giving thanks and glory to you in Jesus' mighty name. <coughs> Amen. <coughs> so that the growth of the rebirth um, I'm going to look at one or two verses um, and maybe just unpack a couple of things uh, and then we'll see how the Lord leads. So I want us just to, to kick off looking at Luke. <coughs> looking at Luke. Uh, so if anybody's new to the Bible, uh, Luke is found in the second half of the Bible. The uh, second half of the New Testament starts off with Matthew. So you go to Matthew, Mark, then eventually you land in Luke. So we're going to look at Luke, Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 34 and 35. We've looked at these before, which just to give us a, a little bit of a, a refresher, uh, and they're also relevant for what we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, so Luke chapter 1, verse 34 and 35. Well known passage of scripture. Uh, maybe it's a passage of scripture we maybe read at Christmas time. So it's the story, it's the conversation at the Virgin Mary, is having with the angel Gabriel all about the birth of Christ. Uh, Mary, as you can imagine, is very confused, uh, worried and frightened of what's going on, what's the angel saying to her, she's going to give birth to a child, but yet she's not even married, she's still a virgin. So you can just imagine the confusion that's going on in Mary's mind. Uh, and, the, and the angel says this to her in verse 34. How will this be, Mary asked, the angel since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. These verses are very interesting, because as you then follow through the story in, in Jesus' teaching, on the night of Jesus' resurrection, as the disciples came to him, he said, breathe and receive the Holy Spirit. Very similar language to what the angel is saying to Mary. Then when Jesus was about to descend after his resurrection, when he was going back to be the Father, he gathered the disciples and he told them to wait in Jerusalem, then you'll see power from on high. Again, very similar language to what the angel is saying to Mary. And I believe as I've been looking at this, and that God has been revealing, that the birth of Christ speaks to us about our birth into Christ. Very, very similar. Then as you, you follow through the story in Luke chapter 2, 
Luke chapter 2, verse 40, then we're going to jump down to 49, 52. But Luke chapter 2, verse 40, it says, And the child, this is Jesus, and the child grew and became strong, and is filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Then in verse 49, it says, and the story here is that so Jesus is around about 12. His parents, Mary and Joseph, have been going up to the temple. It's 15. <laughs> Roughly about 12. That's what most people put them down to. It is 12. Are you can tell that's the 12. <laughs> 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 that's what we used to sit there. I'm sort of So his parents are coming back from the, the Passover uh, and they lose Jesus. <laughs> and they're going to try and find him, and they find him in the temple, and he's teaching. Um, then in verse 49, Jesus says, Why are you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazarene with them, and was obedient to Jesus, was obedient to his parents. Uh, maybe I need to point this out to one children. Uh, then he went down to Nazarene with them and was obedient to them, but his mother treasured all these things to her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. And after that, the Bible is somewhat quiet. Roughly about the age of 12 or 15, give and take, <laughs> up until the age of 30, we don't really hear much else. Or what's going on in the life of Jesus. But then in the age of 30, he then appears and his ministry starts to take off. So for roughly about 18 years, one of the things we could say was happening with Jesus that he was growing as a boy, maturing of who he was, and he was developing into the man of God that he really was. And as we said earlier on, the birth of Jesus speaks to us about our birth into Christ. And if Jesus went through a season of growing and maturing, it seems only right that we also go through a season of growing and maturing. But maybe a wee bit unlike Jesus, he went through those 18 years, we continually grow and mature in our walk with God. And this is really what I want to encourage our hearts with this morning is the growth of the rebirth. Because when we become a Christian, that's not, you know, put your feet up, uh, have some coffee, have a little bit of fellowship, and just sit back until Christ comes back to you. The, 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 when we become a Christian, it's not the start of it, sorry, it's not the end of it, it's just the start of the journey. Mm -hmm. We've now started, the firing line is when, the race has begun, and now it's time to move forward into the fuller and the deeper things that God has for you. And this is exactly what God has spoken even before I've got to bring the word of God. Yeah. And when I've got some scriptures that you can look at, you know, so I've not put these up after the service. These were put down this morning, probably about back at seven as I was finished off my preparation. Ephesians chapter 3, love these with this prayer of Paul. And in verses 16 to 17, Paul says, And out of his glorious riches, he will strengthen you with power in your inner being by the Holy Spirit so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Mm -hmm. Then in verse 19 he goes on to say so that you be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Is that not the invitation that we had this morning? To come into the fullness that God is calling each one of these come into the fullness of what God has for you as an individual and you will be blessed. God doesn't want us to be little children splashing about in the, in the shallowness of the water but he's calling you to come and swim in the vastness of who God is and what he wants to do in your life. Are you wanting the fullness of God to dwell in your hearts by faith? Or have we fell into a trap of spiritual contentment? Charles Spurgeon often warned his, his hearers of be aware of spiritual contentment. 
Be aware of just simply being happy and content in your main thing, the Lamb's Book of Life, but I'm just going to sit here, I'm going to battle and struggle through life until Christ comes back again. He says, no, come into the fullness and know the power of his glorious resurrection power operating in and through your life so you can bring glory to his wonderful, mighty name. That's the reality of Christianity and this is what God is called us into. One of my, my, my passions, and you, you may have picked this up, you might not have, but it's not only for people to come to Christ, but for people to come right into Christ. So the world will see the splendour and the wonder and the glory once again of the face of Christ through the life of his church. The bride of Christ is beautiful, it is glorious. If anybody tells you the bride is broken, it's full of gossip backbite, don't listen to him. The lying, the bride is beautiful, the true bride of Jesus Christ is beautiful. It's righteousness and it's holiness. What's happened is things have come in, it's tried to pollute the bride. There is people in the bride that are not part of the bride. And they're claiming to be the church and they're not the church of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters. Amen. And the only way we can know is by lining up the truth of God's word. I love the church. I love the bride of Christ. Because I see it dressed in robes of righteousness. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if you're in Christ this morning, you are righteous. You are holy. Not because of what you've done, but because of what he has done. You're covered in a robe of righteousness. See yourself as God sees you. And believe what God says about you. And you'll start to behave the way God would have you to behave. You're righteous, you're glorious, and you're beautiful in the eyes of God. This is not my words, this is the word of the truth of Scripture. And God wants us to be mature. Amen. Amen. James 1 tells us, consider your pure joy <coughs> when you face trials of many kinds. <coughs> For your testing of your faith produces perseverance. And perseverance must be allowed to complete its work. So we be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Amen. God wants to mature you this morning, folks. Colossians chapter 1, verse 27 and 28 also talks about the great mystery. A mystery that's been hidden, but now he's been revealed. And the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But Paul then goes on to say um, in, in 28, paraphrasing a wee bit, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ often feel we can do an injustice to the mystery by a lack of maturity. We don't walk in to the full maturity which God has for us and therefore we do an injustice to this wonderful mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Friday afternoon as we're just finishing off the preparation for the cafe, and we're about to open the doors, our dear sister Carol, the Bible led us in prayer. And she prayed and it just really resonated and God really spoke at my heart through it, so bless you Carol. And Carol said, Lord, let's become vessels for your glory. Amen. Wow, let us become a vessel for your glory. And that's really what God wants to say this morning. He wants you, yes you, and yes you as well, to become a vessel for his glory. And to come and to, 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 to come in, to, sorry, to step in to the fullness of what he has for you. To come into that deep place of maturity. St. Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 and we may just unpack this for a few moments and laugh quite a bit this morning. Um, my dear wife already quoted it for me. <laughs> I thought, oh, you're going to be it. It's on my notes. Because 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Any man who's in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone Amen. and the new has come. That is totally 
mind blown. But what does that really mean? Because so much of Christianity that we can think, you know, to become a Christian is something to me. Become the, the best version of myself. It's to, to clean myself up and, and to get myself right and, and maybe, you know, get a shave or maybe put a wee bit of makeup on or get myself some new clothes or, you know, maybe change certain lifestyle things and maybe to get a job or whatever it may be. And we often think, that, that's Christianity. Or, you know, we'll go to church and we'll feel good and, and we'll just get our life sorted. That is not biblical Christianity. That is maybe a good thing to do and it's a nice thing to do, but that itself is not true Christianity. So what is true Christianity? What does it mean that we become new? Does it mean that, you know, once we give ourselves to law, we, we go to bed that night and we wake up and our grey hair becomes black hair? Or we go to bed and we might be small and we wake up tall? We go to bed and we might want to help, we wake up healthy. What does it mean that we become new? Do we have a new face? What does it mean? It's quite simple. It means we have a new nature. It will no longer the person we used to be. And that can create a lot of that confusion because if I'm not the person I used to be, why do I still do some of the things I used to do? And maybe, hopefully, we'll try to unpack that in a wee bit this morning or maybe in future. But you can come with me, I often say this in a Monday, the groups, and I want you to join me for a moment or two. And I want you to come with me in my little wee room of overactive imagination. It's my wee happy place, right? It's the way I go to, to think and to understand stuff. I see one or two people smiling because you're very much aware of my overactive imagination. And I want you to imagine, obviously, my father is my father, right? And in his house, he's made provision for me. There's provision for my food, he's going to put food on my table, I've got a bed to sleep in, I've got clothes to wear, and I've got heat. But not only has he made it for my provision, but he's also made it for my pleasure. Because he'll take me to the cinema from time to time, he'll take me bowling, um, he might even take me to, to football, he'll take me away on family holidays, so I'll have treats, so there'll be pleasure, so my provision and my pleasure is found in my father's house. But let's imagine for a moment that I have lost the ability to really see my dad. I can't, I'm blind, I can't see him, and I can't hear him, and all of a sudden I don't know he exists any longer. I'm not aware that my father is there and I'm not aware of his provision and pleasure within my father's house. What am I going to do? Look for him. Might look for him, but I don't know he's there. But I still have needs. I still have need for pleasure and I still have need for provision. So what am I going to do to meet those needs? Go elsewhere. Go to elsewhere. I could pray, I'm going to go elsewhere. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to live a life independent of what he's provided for me. And I'm going to do my best to try to meet these needs in the best ability I know. But because my father is such a loving father and he wants the best for me, he never leaves me, but he's always there by my side. So I'll go on the highways and the byways. I might wander into deserts and wasteland and darkness and despair and desperation and I'm trying my best to meet the basic needs I have as a man in order to have that fulfilled. But I do not know that the provision and the pleasure has already been met for me in my father's house. But my father is constantly with me and he's walking beside me and he's constantly trying to bring me back in to make me aware of the reality of his provision and pleasure within his house. Question. In my state of unable to see my father, unable to know that he exists, does my father still exist? Yes, of course he exists. Because his existence is not dependent upon whether I believe it or not. He exists outside of my world because I cannot see him. I cannot see him, I cannot touch him, I cannot taste him. I do not know that he exists. And that's the same for us when we are outside of Christ. The Bible talks about we are spiritually dead. 
because our spiritual being at the centre of who we are as an individual is the part of us which enables us to relate with God and to have a relationship with him. But we are born in this world in a state of disconnection, spiritually dead. But I still have that need for basic needs. So what do I do? I go and look for it outside of my family. And I do the best I can in order to try to meet these needs. But if you can imagine, all of a sudden, my eyes are open, and I'm then aware of my father, I then go back, and I'm then able to sit at my father's table. I'm able to eat the food that he wants to provide. I'm able to sleep in the bed that he's gave me. I'm able to wear the clothes that he's gave me. I'm then able to enjoy the pleasures which he wants to give me. At last, I am back in that relationship with God. And so is with the reality of the power of the gospel of Christ Jesus. When we become reborn again, our spiritual being is now open again, and we're able now to have that communication with God. But the problem might be when I eventually start to see my dad and I can come into his house, I have learned for 15, 20, 30 years, but maybe, maybe to live a life independent from him. And every now and again I am tempted to go back to my old way of living because that is what I know, that is what's then ingrained in the depths of me. But over a period of time I can start to learn to become more and more dependent upon God. And we become born again. That is exactly what happens. We become reborn, we come into that connection again with God. Because when we were separated from God, we, we started to think, we started to feel, and we acted independently from God. But now we'll be connected in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 45, speaks about it. Talks about Adam and it says, but the last Adam, that's Christ. The last Adam became a life giving spirit. So when we're connected to God, his very life starts to flow in us. And his life starts to cause us no longer to think and feel and act independently from him, but to start to think and feel and act dependent upon God. We become new. And the Bible says that we're, we're a new crea creation. What it actually means is we're brand spanking new. Never ever existed before. See, there's a newness which we use, which means it's, it's new, but it's not really new. You know, for example, I might say it's like my new jumper folks. It's not really new, right? But imagine it was, I just bought it. So it's new, but it's not new. And what I mean by that is new to me, but existed in a shop for maybe weeks, months before I bought it. Other people might have tried it on. So it's not fully new, but it's new to me. That's one version of new. Or maybe you just caught Katrina's eye and she likes to do nothing. But maybe Katrina knitted me a jumper and says, here we go, Craig. Here's a new jumper which I knitted for you. That newness is brand spanking new. It's never, ever existed before. And when the Bible says any man who's in Christ is a new creation, what it means is you're brand spanking new. You have never, ever existed before. So it's not a better version of yourself. It's not cleaning yourself up to make you feel better. It's a brand spanking new version of yourself. It's never, ever existed before. Not physically, maybe even not mentally, emotionally, or behaviour wise, but in this spiritual realm, we're brand spanking you. And as the life of Christ <laughs> flows into us, that life starts to impact the way we think, the way we feel, and the way we act. And that newness of person is then started to outwork in our daily life. That's the process the Bible speaks of. We often talk about the process of sanctification. In other words, it's just a process of the newness of life starting to take a hold of you and working out. The Bible then goes on to say, and it tells us in 1 John that we are participators of his divine nature. Sorry, Peter, participators of his divine nature. <coughs> John also speaks about 
no longer born of man, but born of God. We become born of God. And when you look at the life of Jesus, you see so many similarities. We've talked about the birth of Jesus, speaks about our birth into Jesus. We then said how Jesus had to grow, we also had to grow. But Jesus was fully man, but yet fully God. We are now in Christ, so we still have our human nature, but we also have a new nature. We're now participators of his divine nature. We become brand spanking new people that have never ever existed before. And I believe this is what God is wanting to help us with, to bring us in to the newness, to bring us into a place where we're truly walking in this new life that God has for us. Yes, there will always be a pull. There will always be a battle and a struggle to try and pull, pull you back into your old way of living. But the more we walk in the newness, and the more we do not feed the old, the more the new will become a dominant force in your life. Because when we were born, we know that we didn't have the, the knowledge of God's ways or the awareness of God's presence. When you become born again, then start to realise this is what God wants in your life. And you can then start to come into an awareness of his presence. And this is what it speaks about with us. I'm going to be finished. In Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10 to 12. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 8, verses 10 to 12. This is what we refer to as the new covenant. This is the new covenant I have established with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. That's the knowledge of his ways. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the awareness of his presence. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. The awareness of God is for every single one of us. God has no favourites. It's from the least of them to the greatest. God wants all of us to know him. Not just for a selected few, not just one or two people to have that close walk, but God wants all of us to have that closer walk. Then in verse 12, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Interesting. In the new covenant, he says, I'll put your laws in my mind, I'll make you aware of my ways, I'll make you aware of my presence, then at last I will forgive your sins. The forgiveness of sins is not the pinnacle of your salvation, <coughs> it's the foundation of it. It's the beginning of it. Because once we've came to that place of forgiveness in Christ, our sins are forgiven, it's now an open door to come into deeper things of God. Mm. And the deeper things of God is an awareness of his presence and a knowledge of his ways. Love your life in him <coughs> and love your life for him. Mm. When God spoke to Moses to bring the people out of Egypt, he says, tell my people to come out so they might worship me. That was a call. First and foremost, the call was to worship God. The Bible tells in the New Testament as Jesus was speaking to the women of Samaria, he says, the day is coming for those who will worship me in spirit <coughs> and in truth. Spirit of God and awareness of his presence and the truth is acknowledgement of his ways. God wants us to know his ways and to know his presence. The growth of the rebirth, coming into that place of deeper spiritual maturity. This morning, may God help us. 
may God truly work out all that he's promised us in each and every single one of our hearts. God is here and he wants to do business for me and he wants to do business for you and he wants to break change. He wants to break free of everything that binds us. Some chains are obvious, some chains are not. Some are more visible, some are more hidden. But God knows. He sang the third song, God is looking at your heart. God looks at your heart and he sees you and he loves you. But he wants to change you. And he knows the things that bind you, the things that hold you back. This morning, are you willing to say, God, I'm letting go? I go down during the week. God is able, but he waits for man to become wrong. Man is not able, but must become wrong. God will never force himself on you. Just the same the illustration I used, and hopefully you followed my train of thought, when I didn't know my father existed, and I walked in the, the highways, and the byways, and the deserts, and the wastelands, and all sorts, but my father was always there, want me to come back. God has never left you. It's just the awareness we've not been aware he's there. <coughs> but God is calling us. First and foremost, he calls us to come into a relationship with him, to break the chains of bind us to come right in. But he also wants us not only just to come to him, but to come right into him. Amen. And often as we travel through life, stuff comes in. Things can happen to us, whether it's been hurt by your next door neighbour, hurt by a family member, or dear say it folks, hurt by church. And these hurts need something. Unaddressed, unattended, undealt with, and we wonder why the years pass, the months pass, and I'm not making any spiritual progress. But God comes at such a time as this. And he says, come on. Come on. Now's the time. Let's do business. Let's break the chains. Some are obvious. Some are not. But God sees them all. God is able. And he wants man to be willing to say, God, yes, I'm allowing you to break these chains and to bring them into the power and the deeper things of God. Has God been speaking to you this morning? There is stirring. There is something. You know. You know what you know what you know. But God is speaking. I can't do it for you. My dad can't do it. Nobody else can do it for you except God. <coughs> but what we would like to do is to stand with you as God does the work. And if you want God to do a work in your heart, I'm going to ask you to come forward in a moment or two as a, maybe as I hand it back to my dad. We'll see how we're going to do this. We're just going to allow God to do it. But if you want God to do a work in your life, I'm going to ask you to come be bold and to stand here and we're going to pray with you. And we're going to believe God to do these great these things for you. So you don't doubt the same person that came in. Whether you've been a, whether you look, we might even be here for the first time or second time, I don't know. And you might never have made that commitment to God, but you're saying, yes, God, I want to make it, and I want to come through. Praise God for that, and I'm going to pray with you. But I believe that there is people here, and you've been here for a long time, you've been walking with God for a while, but you know there is change that needs to be broken. God wants to break these chains. This is not just for new people coming in, this is for us coming into maturity. Because that's what God said. God spoke very clearly this morning, twofold, to break chains at blindness and to come into that deeper place. Let's respond to what God is saying. So if God is calling you this morning, I'm going to ask you to come now and let's stand. Maybe everyone wants to, to sing or put a, a YouTube song or something. But let's come. I'm just going to ask you to come uh, and maybe one or two of us can come with me. And we're going to pray. And we're going to trust God to break these chains that bind you to set you free. Thank you, Father. <coughs>